Good afternoon. This is Peter Wanders. I'm the president and CEO of Anderson Ranch and really excited to have you join us for our virtual art salon today. Um, excited to, uh, to see the community starting to open up. Uh, it's beautiful here on the ranch and we're starting to see people come in and get ready for summer workshops. We'll be running a very low um, number of students in each workshop, but we're, we're really excited that the ranch is alive and well uh, and re ready to uh, deliver our mission of, uh, of teaching art this summer. The uh, virtual um, salons have been just a great way over the past few months to get connected uh, and stay connected with our community. So this is really something we've learned uh, from the COVID crisis that will continue again after the summer. Uh, during the summer, we have a regular speaker series uh, called the uh, uh, Summer Featured Series, but Summer Featured Speaker Series. Um, I can't say that twice, uh, let alone three times in a row. Um, and so next week, please, uh, please look at that other series. Uh, Helen Molesworth will be moderating those conversations. We're really excited uh, to feature those artists as well. Today, we're featuring uh, William Downs. He'll be in conversation with uh, Liz Farrell. Liz is the director of paint, printmaking, and drawing here at the ranch. Uh, William was here last year um, at Liz's invitation to teach a class and uh, so enjoyed getting to know him uh, and uh, really enjoyed uh, spending time and seeing how his class ran. So Liz, I'll uh, pass over to you to enjoy this conversation uh, with William. Uh, for those of you who are participating, we'd love you to ask questions. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A function. Uh, if you click that Q&A function, you can uh, enter your questions. You can do this anytime during the program. And then uh, Liz will field those questions uh, later in the program. Again, so thrilled to have you, William. So thrilled to have you, Liz. Take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. And welcome, everybody, to our virtual art salon. And William, welcome to you. We're so glad to have you here. <laughs> Um, and it's wonderful to see you in, in your space with, with your work behind you. Um, I'm going to echo what Peter said about asking questions. We really um, welcome your questions and we would love to hear from you. So if you type in your chat box um, questions to me, we will be bringing them up um, and I will be asking them during the question and answer portion. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us today and for sharing your practice with us, William. Um, William is a beloved teacher here at the ranch. He is so dedicated um, that he still communicates with his students from last summer really frequently. Um, he teaches an automatic expressive drawing workshop. It's incredibly unique in its philosophy, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, his philosophy about drawing that derives from his own practice. Um, William, we talked a bit earlier about how you're surviving during this COVID crisis, as well as the turmoil and violence and hopeful protests that are taking place right now. Can you talk a bit about how you're faring and how your practice has been impacted. Um, we'd love to see what you're, what you're working on. Yes, of course. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's see, this is a nice list to start with. Um, so we'll start with the first part in um, being uh, removed from life, pretty much, um, <laughs> with COVID. Um, so when it started in March, I had a few projects that were beginning but then they all stopped. So that was the first phase for me because I'm so used to bouncing around, flying all over the place, um, either visiting or doing um, workshops. So that was the first moment of like everything stopping for me and I had to face that and understand like, okay, this is a pause right now, it's not forever. Let's just look at what's happening Think about what you're doing. It's going to pick up soon, but just be patient, which I have a great deal of stamina and patience. <laughs> I've <noticed> so, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I got that from my dad. He's a very patient man. So um, taking the time off gave me a moment where I had to reevaluate myself, reevaluate my catalog, reevaluate the work, um, talk, having conversations with the work and slowly reading things that I've been kind of skimming over 
So for two months, it gave me like quiet time to sit in the studio, which I turned my garage into the studio, which is the garageio. <laughs> and um, there, it was, I was more intimate with the new work, and I kind of found this new moment where, okay, I can slow down my line because my lines are so fleeting all the time. So I was starting to get used to the slow line now, and I was hoping that that's not a bad thing because I'm so, I love the movement and I like how things are fleeting. But I think um, this time is a good time to zen and um, reach out to my friends through a different uh, format instead of meeting them out or seeing them at openings and bars. It's more like Zoom became our connector. And <laughs> so having Zoom studio visits was a new thing for me. So COVID's like teaching me how to be able to use this uh, window now to kind of give a demonstration to how to make work or how to talk about my work or to show what I'm doing without being there. Um, so that's the first question. <laughs> The second question about um, the violence and the protest that's happening, um, it, it kind of, it, it hit me really hard um, recently because I live not too far from the Wendy's um, on University Avenue. It's like in my backyard, six minutes away. So yeah. feeling the pressure of that every day, that, that street has kind of moved my work into a little darker moment in a way. Um, um, the protests that's happening all over the city has been powerful and amazing. Um, yeah. Seeing people's signs and seeing how the, the piles and piles of people gathering together, which looks like the William Downs wall drawing. So yeah, that's <laughs> true. My, my future wall drawings have, are going to be about these protests. Oh. And I have a I've been researching a few artists who are doing that right now, which I really love that wall drawers or mural artists are paying attention to the protest. Um, Diego Rivera is one of my heroes, and yeah. to see how he was dealing with, you know, the Industrial Revolution, now it's like we're dealing with the race revolution and the political revolution, yep. which I never considered in my work so much, um, uh -huh. being political, but I think I'm gonna give that a go. So that's something I've been thinking about. Um, when Avery got shot, um, that hit me hard too. And what, when I, since you know I, I do like this automatic drawing, you know, yeah. myself under drawing restraints, <laughs> yeah. I thought that I would sit down. His birthday was the day before he was murdered. So I thought that for 26 minutes, he's gonna be 26 years old. So I thought I would tie myself and do 26 drawings, 26 minutes, and um, think about everything as I go. So those are the restraints. So that's kind of how both of those um, new points in our life are working with me. Wow, yeah, that sounds really incredible. And um, is that, is that the series happening behind you related to the project and can you kind of um I, I guess what i would ask is how you know this automatic drawing practice that you are engaging in sort of helps to access some of that um some of the agony and some of the the pain but also um acknowledges human beings in a way that i think is really beautiful thank you yes um, I feel like automatic drawing is kind of a way of filtering things out. It's like you're drawing and thinking at the same time. So all your marks are fresh, all the movement is fluid, and whatever pops in your brain triggers an image. And that's kind of how I think about it. The drawings behind me are from a series called Mask Drawings, which is kind of ironic because I made them before we had to start wearing masks. <laughs> But I was thinking more about the African mask and how the symbology is coded on the actual mask itself. Yeah. Which now people are jumping on the mask bandwagon and making masks for people and Chanel Mason, um, all the fashion people making masks. So I feel like, okay, that's interesting. Absolutely. Um, 
But I made these drawings when I um, was in a residency in Tampa, Florida at um, Tempest Projects. And what I did was every morning before making my larger drawings, I would sit down for two hours and set myself up and draw as many drawings as I could before it was time for breakfast. But thinking about the face, thinking about the expression, thinking about feelings and how people wear their expression on their face, that's what I'm really concerned with and I think a lot about with these words. And then... That's interesting how you talk about, you know, wearing an expression and perhaps a mask that doesn't necessarily show that sort of true emotion underneath. Yes. And yet, I think of your process as so evocative of emotion. I've watched you do a process like this with a room full of people um, all mm -hmm. together. And that, that sort of community drawing practice, it's interesting how you... I mean, you kind of evoke that in this grid. These almost sort of feel like people that you know and, and um, you know, that are kind of having conversations with each other. Yes. Um, I think what inspires me is when groups of people can get together and draw. You do get this kind of feeling of you can see everybody's minds working together. Um, so I really do enjoy that aspect of the collectiveness of the emotions and the gathering of people. So in my classes, I like to have people get together and collaborate with each other. And that's something that people don't necessarily do all the time. So it kind of breaks through this beautiful ego and vulnerability and it accesses this moment where people can arrive at this freedom. And working together, they feel inspired because they don't know that person, but by the time my clock goes off or the class ends, they're gonna have a friend and then they're gonna share their, their experiences later on about how that moment was. Yeah, you know, and that's interesting. That kind of does feed into the idea of um, sort of showing protest. You were talking about sort of in the future, oh. making drawings about that, but the sort of collective, um, I wouldn't call it a performance because it, it has a different, maybe a different quality, but I think um, sort of the idea of the collective experience um, is one that you are not um, new to. And so it actually makes a lot of sense that you're, you're going in that direction, although you said that was new subject matter for you. It is. Um, yes. Well, um, I, if I can ask another question about drawing, um, a lot of people have been kind of talking about drawing as a very kind of um, visceral expression. And um, the trend in drawing, though, has, has begun to kind of lean heavily on the conceptual. And um, although drawing inherently lends itself to expression of an idea or recording of an observation. And I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about the process of drawing and how it kind of ignites um, a natural sort of content that can emerge. Uh, that's, and I don't know if that's a description of, of somewhat of how you think of drawing or if maybe you can amend that or add to it or change what I'm saying. No, no, that's good, that's great. Um, so I, I think of how musicians get together and imp when they improvise together, which they, they follow each other, they look at each other's mannerisms, they know what G turns into E, like they follow that whole thing. For me, I like to have people think about drawing in that way where they're just sitting there unwinding, letting things go, and then following the trance or following the line until something happens. And then you just follow it and then things take off in a different direction. So it's like the performative of improvisation to me. And I think that drawing is more honest that way. Um, I had a conversation with Louise Bourgeois um, years ago when I was in grad school, and she's telling me how, you know, the dreamscape is the easiest way to find things that you never see every day. 
So I think a lot about how that works in this automatic drawing state where you kind of let go and just follow and let the mistakes guide you. Or if the mistake turns into something more larger, then it's this way of like keeping the formal aspects, but letting abstraction and all of the other things be that. So if you're a formalist, um, try drawing your eyes close, you know, kind of <laughs> change, change the way you see it or use a bigger brush um, and try to make one line, you know, you know, the smallest line with the biggest brush. So things like that for me is kind of the way I like to make my drawings monumental in such a small, compact scale. Yeah. And I think with that theory, you can loosen it up or origin it and, um, you know, have like a, a really old brush to draw with, you know, <laughs> changes <laughs> things up a little bit. Yeah. So I, I like having these kind of restraints or different tools to kind of help my my strict brain kind of loosen up a little bit. Um, when I was at the Atlanta College of Art, I worked with some very intense instructors who went to Black Mountain College, who studied with elders. So I had that discipline and that kind of restraint um, until I met this woman named Mildred Thompson. And she's the one that kind of got me to think about Hey, let's listen to the song, draw it. And yeah. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. So having music is a nice way to kind of, you know, find color, find line, find movement, and things like that. So that's kind of how I trace everything. And I keep the drawings fresh in that way of like using things to kind of make it a challenge to, to make them. And do you ever feel, um, or, or at any point in your career, did you ever feel like a little bit, I don't want to sound negative, but pinned down or bogged down by the constraints of this kind of conceptual art movement? I mean, or, or how do you see that as sort of fitting into what you're doing or alongside what you're doing? Do you reject it? Do you embrace it? Are you kind of, where are you? I'm curious. <laughs> well, I think in graduate school is where it hit me hard. Um, I was with some really amazing artists at MICA in Baltimore, Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, and a lot of the guys that were in that program when I started were very formal, very conceptual, very traditional. And it was kind of intense for me to like, okay, should I do something like that? Um, but I thought, okay, to prove myself on this level, I should just be a drawing machine and just open it up so that I can be in all of the sections of making work. So I think that's when it kind of started for me and that's kind of how I live life now. It's like, I just work and work and work and that to me, um, with the knowledge of all of these other types of drawings, which I love, um, I just kind of interject that into the work so it can take its presence on whatever form, whether it's physical, figurative, non-objective. Um, yeah. So I think that's kind of how I kind of craft myself. And being political right now is, you know, a new thing and a good thing, and I love that. Um, yeah. And I think I'm tailoring it into this time right now. Yeah, and, and finding a way to take the way you authentically make and, and, and find a way to, to work that into that voice. Um, I guess, um, I know you had some images to show us and I guess um, one of the things I was gonna ask you is if you can speak about, as you're showing these works, if you can speak about where the figures in your works like kind of come from, there's a certain, they're so personal, but they also have a certain anonymity. And maybe we can kind of talk about the figure a little bit as you're showing us some work and, and what they represent. Okay, great. Yes. And William is in his um, space and he's gonna show us a few more of, of sort of what he's doing, but at the moment he's sharing his screen to show us some other images.
Perfect. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with, uh, it's, it's going to be a spider web because some of the work is out of order and some of it is on paper and some of it is on the wall. But I'm going to guide you on a path to that, that um, drawing direction. So I love ink wash. It's my favorite medium. And the reason why is because it's a very um, chance medium. Um, you let water guide you through it, so the patience has to be there. But your line becomes really unique, and that's what I love about having different tools and different brushes. I use a, a lot of Japanese um, bamboo brushes, and I like um, using really cheap brushes from Utrecht. Here are a few of the examples of what I like to travel around with. I have a travel pack, so whenever I go and do workshops or residencies, I carry a certain um, group of brushes with me in order to keep myself fresh and to keep my lines solid. I just have to say, I just love this image. It just it takes me right back to your workshop at the ranch and seeing the way you kind of line up your brushes and yet they still, they, you know, having the ink all over them and there's yes. a messiness, but there's also a, a real system to the way you work. Yes, exactly. And I have to have that system in order to stay fresh. <laughs> um, this is a wall drawing that was in my studio. Um, I was awarded an Artadia Award, and I was awarded um, the Working Artist Project here in Georgia. This is one of the wall drawings that I made for the studio visit um, with both of those awards. Um, here you see my figures. Um, they're all kind of piled on top of each other. And that's something that I really love is the groupings of people gathering and having, you know, connection by just overlapping each other, which I stole from um, people like um, Renoir and um, Bosch, Hieronymus Bosch, and a few other um, Renaissance painters who use groups of people and just pile them all up together. But this one is called connecting with Brenda Downs, which is my mother. We communicate through our iPhones because we're in two different cities. And she's learning about technology as much as I am, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. So she's an inspiration for this drawing. Oh, that's beautiful. Michael Jordan is, has been a huge fan. I've been a fan of his for so long. But what I really love about him is this idea of the super body, the superhuman. He is someone who can fly. He's someone who can move in a way that most people's bodies can't uh, move as a basketball player or athlete. So I, I use a lot of Michael Jordan's gestures in my drawings, primarily with the silhouette figures when you see them. Um, but what I do is I, I look at how he's flexing his muscles and bending his arms and hands and gesturing, and I flatten that out with my black figures. Um, this is a wall drawing in process, just to kind of give you an idea of how I start drawings. I usually start with a really light line throughout the whole space, and then I'll start with bringing certain characters who I collected over time and I'll start placing them in the composition and then filling that in with a landscape. But this is at Tempest Projects in Tampa, Florida. And is your process sort of, you don't have a full plan at the beginning. You, you are kind of um, letting this kind of unfold um, and responding to what you're drawing rather than having a whole plan at the beginning. Am I correct on that? Yes, exactly. I like to use every day, like when I'm out, um, in different environments, whether it's in the grocery store, at the mall, or places where people um, gather, like parks and spaces like that, I'll just kind of stare and observe, and my brain will be like a recorder, recording how certain people are moving around and um, interacting with each other. That, to me, becomes a cinematic um, unfold when I go into a space. I think about how Merce Cunningham would stand on the sidewalk in New York and just watch people walk around 
and then he would take um, someone's body movement into the um, space and reenact that through a performance. Um, so I, I'm thinking a lot about that. And this is how I um, fill things in. Sometimes music will trigger an image and I'll bring that into the composition. Um, certain lyrics will spark an image. And these are um, some of the faces that I would see walking down the street. I would memorize them and redraw them. I think that's a very hard thing to do and I like that my brain can just let go and not feel um, concerned with making everything correct on the human face. Yeah, and and does, that, the yeah. does that affect your level of awareness as you go out on the street and, and you're surrounded by people? Are you finding that you always do that? You're sort of mentally drawing people as you look at them? I'm just Yes, curious. I am. And the most unique person is someone who I really focus on. Like if someone's um, <laughs> um, gesturing a lot, to me, that's like a juggler, so I'll bring that into my composition when I'm drawing. Um, people that use their hands a lot when they talk, I like that expression. So certain faces um, kind of trigger that image. And then there are characters that I redraw in certain compositions. These three, um, they've shown up in four different wall drawings, and they're just crew of people who are just kind of leisurely hanging out, um, unaware and aware and sleeping. That's what they represent. <laughs> and this is a combination of wall drawing and works on paper. That's kind of how my whole, um, I guess, third part of my new way of working is to framework and then place that on the composition of the wall drawing, just to add another layer or another way of drawing, or it gives like a window of a, a different slice of life for me. Yoga has been this um, new thing that I've been looking closely at and thinking a lot about um, how people are now using yoga as a way of um, changing their bodies. So I love how the body scape changes with yoga and how people push their limits and how they contort their bodies and um, bend themselves to reach this higher um, plane or to kind of get rid of something. But I, I love how yoga is now a part of my work. Yeah. And the tassel that you see hanging down, that's another layer of my line. It's like this reflective thing that really kind of makes the viewer um, think about movement when they're walking through my installations, when they're in a closed space. It's kind of like this gestural line that reminds you that something's hanging out. And it also reflects um, the drawing a little bit. So I like how that's a part of um, my installations now. So that show is called Let the Wind Carry Us, um, which um, I made while I was um, at Anderson Ranch. Actually, I think I went away for a weekend. Or I think I was in between residencies while doing this wall drawing. So a lot of the, the community at Anderson Ranch kind of seeped into this drawing also. I remember you working on a very large scale wall drawing, um, sort of you were in the studio day and night, overnight. And um, so um, it was wonderful to see you kind of spread out and use the space that way. Yes, yes. Here I am at Anderson Ranch, giving a demonstration to my students on using your whole body to draw with. <laughs> wonderful, yeah. I remember that. So, um, and, and speaking of that and Merce Cunningham, if, if you don't mind me interjecting with a question, um, is, is performance, I, I wonder if you think about drawing as performance, you talk a lot about gesture and um, 
using your body and almost and yoga is even you know arguably a kind of performance whether it be a private and inward right. one. I'm curious what you think about that term and if you apply it to your drawing. I do. I, I love um, the performative aspects of um, group activities, whether it is a sport or it is yoga, when there's a lot of people in a room together, breathing, bending, twisting, contorting, um, and also observing each other because some people are more flexible than others and some people look at that as a goal. Um, so for me, I'm trying my best to learn a lot of yoga, but at the same time, I'm, I like to kind of pretend to know a lot about yoga in, in terms of what positions I like to um, activate on myself, which is headstands and, and handstands. So for me, that's my performative yoga, which then seeps in the drawing. So it's great that you asked this question as I pull this wall drawing up, which is um, one of my favorite wall drawings because it talks a lot about what we are just talking about in terms of performance and yoga and bending and twisting. But for me, when I'm working in a space, this was a group show. I think there were 12 to 15 artists in the space also working on the wall in different ways. So for me, that was a, a nice way of letting go of the studio private practice and opening up to this public practice where there are other artists watching you work. So for me, I like that kind of, let me show you how I'm making this line and I'll put my whole body into it. And, or let me do a headstand for a few seconds and then remember that and then draw that or redraw that. Or I'll ask someone to stand on their hands or do something and then draw that. So the activation of the participant and maker to me is very important. And it kind of fuels different imagery and small narratives that can be told when observing the drawing. You know, if people who were watching you draw, they'll be like, oh yeah, I really like how you were standing at the top of that ladder and reaching up so high on the ceiling. To me, that's a performance. So I think about all of these kind of um, parts and put them together, whether it's in the drawing or just in my mind for the next drawing. Um, but Trisha Brown is another person that I love, and I, I think she's very special in terms of how she really uses her body in the work, and also when she performs, she's thinking about her body as a drawing. Yeah, that's really amazing. I also think it's amazing to see the proportions that are accentuated in this piece. Um, yes. And, and to think about, you know, I think about, um, I was just showing today um, my students, the, the work of Jacob Lawrence. I don't know if, if you're excited about his work, but I love the sort of exaggerated proportions once in a while to kind of show a movement, the activity yes. of walking or working or something like that. And I think of that as I look at this work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Jacob Lawrence was one of my very first painters that I fell in love with when I was in high school. I went to Magnet High School, so art history was part of our program. But one day I brought in a painting that was very vivid and bold. My, prof my professor asked me if I knew of a guy named Jacob Lawrence, and I was like, no, who is that? And he went up to his office and came back and he had a book and he handed it to me. He was like, take this home, keep it for a week or two. And that blew me away. I was like, Jacob Lawrence is amazing. His hands, the way that he piles the people in his composition, the landscape, the cityscape, those are things that kind of burn my brain as a young painter at the time, where I was like, I want all my work to feel this way. I love the expression, I love the movement, I love the feeling. Um, so with that all in my mind, when I I think I was a sophomore in college, Jacob Lawrence gave a talk at the High Museum. Um, right. it, it was so important for me to meet him uh. that <laughs> I figured out the back stairwell that led to the parking lot where they took him through the exit so oh. that he wouldn't be bombarded with all the people in the audience. And <laughs> I remember 
standing on the sidewalk and he walks out and I was like, Jacob Lawrence, you're one of my heroes. Can I have your autograph? <laughs> Yeah, that's really amazing. Um, just a little side note is I grew up in Seattle where he was a, a, an artist. And um, as a child also, um, he illustrated, well, he, there was a children's book based on his paintings um, uh, about Harriet Tubman. And it had an impact on me that still resonates in my mind every time I, every time I work or make anything. So um, that's interesting to hear your story. Nice, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I really do think about him a lot now. And I think a lot of my friends who are also working on Black American artists are looking at Jacob and rethinking about his work. Um, this is another large scale wall drawing that I made in LA at Eva Cimento Gallery. Um, it's called um, soft place to lay and this is another grouping of lots of bodies um, sort of like Jacob Lawrence. Um, the black figure there is um, the shadow that looms over my characters as they entwine, not entwine, mingle, not mingle, stretch and become part of the landscape. Um, yeah, so this is really incredible. I wonder, William, if you would be interested maybe showing us a couple more and then taking some questions. And the only reason I ask not to cut you off, I'm being bombarded. People are so excited. They're sending in so many questions. Um, you don't have to rush. I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I'm getting a lot. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure people want to um, get that opportunity as well. This is fantastic, though. Can you tell us about this piece? Yes, I made this piece with a um, stick, um, and it's called He's Gone. Um, I made this just a day or two after my father passed away, and I thought that I would remove myself as far as I could, kind of like Matisse um, does with his long brush drawings. But I um, made it with a stick, and it was just these, these emotions that I was feeling about um, someone leaving this earth but it's called He's Gone, and it's just a ink and water on paper. Oh. Wow, that's, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, Liz, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up with this video. Okay. That, really about that. Oh, yeah, I would love to, for you to show the video for sure. So this one um, happened back in November. Um, it's one of my largest wall draw. Uh, it was on the wall, actually, it's on canvas. So it's one of my largest um, works on canvas. It's 100 feet total, but it's um, a lot of the elements that all of my drawings are compiled with. It's called um, How Are the Mountains Doing Today? And you can see that there's a lot of yoga and there's a lot of tints of um, homeless guys that I know and a pile of yoga guys that I'd like to bring with me. But that's, that's it. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you for showing us that. It's nice to see the, um, the video because there's a sense of my body being in that space and sort of turning and, and viewing and relating to those wall drawings. So thank you for sharing that. That was really, really wonderful and special. Um, so if you would like um, to take questions, I'd be happy to kind of throw some out to you, William. Are you ready yes. for some questions? I'm getting I'm so, and I won't have the time to answer everybody's, but I'm gonna do my best. And, um, okay, so let's see. I've got one from Devra Arante, Deborah. And the question is, what drives your decisions of scale and material? Um, let's see. 
I think that's a good question. Um, I'm so flexible in terms of how I feel about that because um, I think whenever I'm invited to an exhibition, if they want me to do a big wall drawing, I love that. Um, but um, I think the most important part to me is having a lot of drawings that are small first. So I, I like keeping a, a nice large pile of small drawings that I kind of bring to a larger space and make a bigger composition. And my tools, ink wash, um, it's like the most limited palette. And I love how that you can stretch, you know, going from really light to really dark with it. So that's what I love. And it's a challenge because it's really hard sometimes because you're not always going to get the right lightness or the right darkness. But so that's why I like to limit my palette and I, I like to stretch my scale. So I like to make drawings really small to really gigantic. That's, that's great. Um, we have another question from Jake Rosenbluth. Um, the question is, hi, Liz and William. I teach high school art in Chicago. I'm wondering what William might suggest to students, young artists, or those who don't have access to all the traditional art materials in classrooms due to COVID on ways to be resourceful and not allow this time to stifle art making. Or how has he been successful with non-traditional art tools while isolated? Thank you. Nice, that's a good one. Um, for me, I've um, been challenging myself with learning how to make animation. So that to me is kind of a, a new way of um, using technology to kind of access a new way of drawing when I'm not making work on paper. So that's one. And number two is when I was a little kid, my favorite thing was to draw in telephone books. Well, when I didn't have a sketchbook or paper um, like I do now. So I think for those guys, they should draw on everything. You know, have them draw on um, clothing because that's a really cool thing to do now with certain young um, students. Um, let's see what else. I think draw on envelopes that come in the mail. Like there's so much paper that's just out there that they can just draw on. And if they accumulate it, you know, that turns into an installation ready to go. So I think if you talk to them about installation art and artists that make drawings on bound paper, bound objects, um, that's another way of getting their brains to think about the expansion of drawing and recycling drawing. Oh, that's great. Those are very good ideas. Um, I have another question from Paula Evans. She says, hey, William, so good to see you. Could you please comment on the frequency and function of barbed wire in your work? Also, could you please comment on the significance of your reflective vests? Love you and your work, Paula, and she's a summer alumna. <laughs> nice. Hello, Paula. Thank you for the question. Um, so I, my work has a lot of layers and um, different things function and they take on different reasons. The thorn for me is not um, a threatening aspect. It's more of a um, security or protecting coat, kind of like roses. They have thorns to protect them from um, danger. So a lot of my characters carry these um, or wear these thorn outfits as a way of protecting themselves. And then I, I think there are people that look at that as Bob Wire. And I think um, people bring their own interpretations to the work. And I like that. And I feel like if someone feels that, we can talk about that. And it won't be what I'm thinking in a threatening way. Um, because my work is so um, honest and it's about the security and this um, freshness. There's never a threat. There might be a little darkness, but never a threat. So, so that's why I uh, use the um, Bob wire. Oh, well, that's great. And the reflective vest is, I feel like every artist should have a, you know, your outfit. <laughs> and I love working. So whenever I'm working on installations with a crew, usually we're all wearing these reflective vests. And I love that. And also, most of um, the United States is under construction, so there's always guys on the corner working or something in a reflective vest. So for me, I'm like 
giving my my um, love to them, but also bringing it inside of my work world because I'm such a worker. So I like to use it as my uniform. That's so great. Thank you for that explanation. Um, we really only have time for one more question. I want to um, put this out there from Philippe Thomas. Um, you mentioned that you used music to influence your work. What type of music or artists do you listen to um, while you're creating or to create your work? That's a good question. Um, it depends on mood for me. My work is very moody and my work takes on different expressions. So I kind of curate my music according to <laughs> when I wake up, I'm like, okay, I wanna make narrative work today. So I'll go to my music stack and I'll bring in um, a few musicians who bring in imagery for me. And um, Prince is one of those artists. He's a very important um, person to me. Um, Bunny Prince Billy, um, let's see, Jim Callahan, um, Miles Davis, Sun Ra, when I want to get loose and abstract. Um, when I'm in my classroom, I like to bring in music that doesn't have content just so that people can start to feel and use their own narratives. So um, that's kind of how I use music inside and outside. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. William, um, we are so lucky to have gotten this conversation. You've been really generous to share your ideas and your practice and your space and your new work with us and your ideas about future work. I know that's a vulnerable topic for most artists, so I really appreciate yeah. that you put that out there. You may, now you've committed yourself to this. For yes. <laughs> to see it. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I want to make a few announcements um, before we say goodbye. Um, this is our last art salon for the summer. Um, we have a summer series um, featured artists and conversations program that kicks off next week on July 2nd. And everyone who's been enjoying our virtual art salons should also join us on Thursdays, um, the same time at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time to see this great lineup of artists. We'll start with Mark Grogen on um, July 2nd and have seven weeks of one of our most popular programs at the ranch. And um, we have a lot of online workshops. They are filling fast. So um, we're adding more um, as time goes on. So please keep checking our website for all of our events, all of our virtual events. And we love having you all as part of our community. And I just want to say again, thank you so much, William, for your time and your um, openness. It's been really, really wonderful to have you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for bringing me here. And it's we look forward to seeing you next summer and all yes. you can look for when, when we put it out there. Look, look for his class. <laughs> and also, thank you, William. And thank you, all of you.